Right, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Richard. Um, as Paul said, um, this paper um, is, looks at the economy-wide impacts of the, and, and risks associated with the farm input subsidy program um, in Malawi. Um, and, and the way we see it, a very important pass, part of this uh, growth poverty puzzle that, um, that, that we tried to tackle in the Growth and Poverty Project. Um, the study um, was really conducted on, uh, as part of another um, UNU wider um, research program on, on development under climate change. Um, co authors James Thurlow, um, who until very recently was with UNU wider, and Channing Arn, to you, uh, who is also um, very closely affiliated with, with UNU wider. Now, as, as Richard explained, agriculture is a, is a key driver of national GDP growth in Malawi. Um, we've had massive or very rapid agricultural growth, and as a result, um, sustained national GDP growth of about 67%, and one would have expected um, you know, significant poverty reduction. Now, the gap study that Richard just um, talked about raises some, some, some questions, um, not only about the, uh, about the national um, growth figures that we, or the national accounts figures that we have, but also about the official um, poverty outcomes. But if taken at face value, um, then it's certainly disappointing and, and, and you know, one would have expected a, a much bigger impact from the farm input subsidy program. So what we try and do in this study is to, um, first of all, add a piece to that uh, growth poverty puzzle, but then secondly, um, also contribute to the FISP evaluation literature um, by conducting an economy-wide um, assessment of the program that really uh, tries to identify all the, all the impact pathways and spillover effects um, rather than just looking at you know, impacts in the sector alone or impacts for beneficiary households um, on their own. And through doing this, hopefully, we can kind of isolate the impact of the farm input subsidy um, on growth and poverty in Malawi and see whether that's consistent with what the, uh, what the official trends are saying. Um, so the farm input subsidy program has been implemented annually since about 2005-06. Um, it's very widely targeted. Over half of smallholders in Malawi, you're talking about 1.5 million farm family households um, probably about 40% of the total Malawian um, population receive this subsidy. And it's also very generous. Um, the fertilizer and the seed inputs that are being provided under this program, um, according to my um, kind of back-and-envelope calculation, should um, produce enough maize to satisfy a family's average, annual um, maize demand. Um, maize is a, is a very important staple in Malawi. Um, accounts for about uh, 60 or 70% of calories consumed by the household. But it's also a very, uh, uh, sorry, and, and along with that, the fertilizer is not entirely free. The seed is free, but the fertilizer um, has a re redemption uh, fee attached to the voucher of about 500 kwacha. That's about $1.50 um, to get 100 kilograms of, of fertilizer. So it's, it's, it's not very costly to the household to participate in this um, if they're lucky enough to, to be selected. It is very costly, about 3% of GDP, 70% of the agricultural budget, um, so, so clearly some important you know, opportunity costs in terms of spending that we need to, to, to think about. So initially there was a great deal of support also globally. I mean the, the, the program was, um, um, was, you know, was, was on the front or, or there was a, uh, an article on the front page of the New York Times. Um, but as time uh, progressed, uh, you know, I get the sense that there's growing skepticism about, um, about input subsidy programs generally but also specifically in Malawi. Um, there are the obvious implementation issues around procurement and logistics and um, you know, corruption. Um, but then also bigger, bigger issues you know, that need to, need to be addressed. Um, first of all, fiscal sustainability. Um, what about policy alternatives? Can we achieve the same goals um, with other policies that are less distortive um, in our economy? Um, how well would the program perform under, un, un, under weather risk? Um, in 2008-09, we, we had a doubling or, or a even more than that, about 140% spike in, in, in world fertilizer prices, which had tremendous implications for the budget of this program, and eventually, um, you know, kind of probably was 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 one of the causing factors of, of, of an economic crisis in Malawi. So, 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 you know, the program does does you know it does come with with um, serious risk concerns that we need to take into account as well. The evidence that we have at the moment. Um, you know, ranges from, from you know, suggesting marginally positive returns to the program um, to more recent evaluations, you know, looking at current prices you know, of fertilizer and, and, and maize, um, suggesting relatively high returns to this program, um, not only in terms of, of, of the grain output, but also in terms of household 
um, income of beneficiaries. Um, the implications for the rest of the economy is less clear, and that's where we, where we try and come in. So what we're doing um, here, and I lifted that top paragraph straight from the paper simply because it, uh, you know, it, it, says it, quite, it explains it quite well. It's a kind of a mixed methods approach um, where we harness the strength of both ex post um, evaluation data, you know, not anything that we had done, but you know, a lot of the analyses that have already been done, the data is there. We use that ex post data. We triangulate that with other information we have about, um, uh, you know, about um, input use and technologies within, within agricultural sectors in Malawi. Um, and we then build this into our ex ante modeling framework, which is an economy-wide framework, um, to really get a comprehensive picture of um, uh, and, and, and what we think is a, is a fairly unique um, approach to, to program evaluation. So essentially what we do is we, we, we have a CG model um, we calibrate it with the 2003-04 SAM. Um, the reason for that is that that is our, our you know, a, a good um, base year for a, a farm input subsidy program evaluation. Um, this model includes a traditional maize sector, which looks like you know, maize produced, the, the way we produce maize before the input subsidy program came along. But then we build into that new sectors, which we're going to call FISP sectors or um, yeah, and, and we're going to have a, a FISP maize sector, um, which is where all the, all the subsidized maize is going to be produced. We have a FISP fertilizer sector, through which we import the fertilizer needed for, for this FISP sector. And we have a FISP seed sector as well. And, and we take program design elements um, you know, and farm level evaluations of the program to, to carefully construct these, these sectors. And what we then essentially do is in our simulation, we exogenously allocate 500,000 hectares of land to the, these new sectors, blow them up to scale, and as they grow, they pull in the resources that are needed um, in order to become, uh, you know, to, to produce the maize um, that we expect to be produced under FISP, um, and, and it ultimately then exactly replicates um, the, uh, the impact of the farm input subsidy program at the sector level, right? So we can then d measure these, these direct production effects of the program. But the usefulness of having this inside, embedded inside an economy-wide model is we can also look at the spillover effects into the rest of the economy, um, specifically those associated with uh, price and income trans transmission effects, resource allocation. I mean, there's tremendous competition for resources when you, when you introduce a big program like this. Um, also, financing implications and balance of payments effects. None of these kind of indirect effects have ever been evaluated. So as far as we know, this is, this is the first paper that attempts to do that. Um, we can also then, because we have this ex ante model framework now set up with um, a, a simulated farm input subsidy program, we can look at things like what happens if we change our assumptions about marginal returns to fertilizer use, um, which is a very important parameter in our, in our benefit cost analysis. Um, what about playing around with program scale um, or with fertilizer price shocks or with, with weather variability? Um, so it becomes a very useful tool not only for kind of traditional impact evaluation but also playing around now with, with alternative program designs and, and, and risks. So this is basically how we build the, the, um, the new FISP sectors. So there's FISP maize. We have two types of seeds that are being distributed under the program, and one is a composite open pollinate variety, the other one is hybrids. Back in 2006-07, the program that we specifically evaluate, or the year that we evaluate, um, about 60% of the seed that was distributed um, were hybrid seeds. Right, so they have slightly different characteristics in terms of yields, in terms of drought tolerance, um, but also in terms of recyclability. Um, hybrids need to be purchased every year. We just do a static analysis, so we don't actually look at the, this, this option of recycling the composite maize seed varieties, um, which is something that um, we may need to consider doing in the future. You'll notice that we assume, based on recommended fertilizer application rates, there's a much higher, and, and because fertilizer is being given for free, much higher um, fertilizer use in our, in our FISP sectors compared to our traditional maize um, sectors. Um, also exclusively use of improved, improved seed varieties. We specifically look or take into account the, uh, the seed planting rates. Uh, slightly more labor needed. And then ultimately, um, you'll see the big yield differences between these different maize varieties. Um, so essentially, as we shift maize away from um, Additional agricultural sector or shift land across to these um, these FISP, these subsidised sectors, we do expect average maize yields to increase. Economy. Um, now, 
this yield can be decomposed into um, a component associated with the seed itself, so the seed characteristics, but then also um, a component associated with the marginal return to fertilizer use, um, which ultimately comes from this um, assumption down here, that for every kilogram of nitrogen that you add to the soil, you're going to get roughly 15 kilograms of extra grain um, for composites and 18 for, uh, for hybrids. And these are the same numbers that are being used in what we can call the, the official valuation of the farm input subsidy program in Malawi, being done every year by, by Andrew Dawood and, and, and Sowas. Right, so looking at some of the results, um, the first one that's of interest is, is the top one here, maize production. Uh, we have two types of funding scenarios. The first one was really just to kind of see, well, what if this was a free gift and donors paid in full for this program? Um, the second one is the tax-funded one where, where the Malawian government, as is um, currently the case, pays um, about 80, 85% or so of, 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 of the program costs. Um, so focusing perhaps just now on, 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 the, on the final column, we have an increase of about 300,000 um, metric tons of maize, which is a little bit less than what the official program evaluation suggests. And the reason for that is um, we take into account reallocation of land. So what's happening to total maize land? Initially, we have about 1.5 million hectares um, planted to maize. And that's your, that was your kind of traditional maize production. We then shift 500,000 hectares um, into, um, into FISP maize, and we tell the model, well, you know, go and reallocate land across all the other agricultural sectors based on, on, on um, returns and profits in those other sectors. And ultimately what that happens is because we're producing more on less land, um, it's actually profitable for farmers to reallocate land away from uh, traditional maize and, and, and into other sectors, and particularly um, export sectors in a minute. Um, my average, our average maize yield increases from about 1.32 in the economy to um, about 1.81, so a 0.49 um, increase uh, uh, metric tons per hectare. Um, because of this reallocation of land, we have an increase in crop diversification, uh, fairly significant declines in, in maize prices, which is consistent with some of the more recent kind of micro-level evaluations that have been done. Um, a real exchange rate effect, obviously, when it's donor-funded, there's, there's an appreciation in the exchange rate, but there's a depreciation when it's funded internally. Um, and when we have this depreciation, we actually see down here a significant um, a boost in exports as farmers reallocate land into export sector specific. So in terms of GDP effects, roughly 1.9% um, impact on, on GDP um, and absorption effects, etc. And this absorption number is, is what we use really to come up with our own benefit cost ratio. Now the official evaluation for the same year, 2006, came up with a with the benefit cost ratio which we term a production-based benefit cost ratio of around one, depending on assumptions, but it was roughly around one. We, we, we get a very similar um, benefit cost ratio, 0.92. Um, and the reason ours, or we think the reason ours is slightly lower than Andrew Dawood's estimate um, is because, again, because of this land reallocation that we permit. Right? So you know, farmers simply decide, well, we don't need to grow that much maize. We buying the market. Um, but the important thing is our, what we call our economy-wide benefit cost ratio. And this now takes into account all these indirect spillover effects from the program. And that's about 60% higher than our direct production-based benefit cost ratio. Um, so we see there are really significant indirect effects that none of the, the other program evaluations have been able to capture. Right. Um, just something on, on uh, factor returns and poverty. Fairly significant increases in, in the returns to land because of increased uh, productivity. Um, and then average farm wages um, also increase. And that, that ties in with this assumption of ours that you know, the, the, the subsidized maize production is a more labor-intensive activity, so we, we, there's an increase in demand for labor. Um, decline in poverty of about 1.78%, or percentage points, I should say. Right? So... Um, not massive, right? um, but certainly not insignificant. Um, so the program does have um, some poverty um, effects, but also fairly significant effects for, for urban households, even in this scenario where we 
primarily tax urban households and get them to pay for this program. And that is, that, that's, that's linked to the, um, um, to the fact that urban households actually benefit a lot from declining maize prices as well. And obviously, um, you know, from, from, you know, from the transport contracts that are, that are linked um, to the program, which we also account for. Um, now we get to this issue of the marginal return to fertilizer use. And our reading of, or, or our average, considering the 15 and the 18 that I had up before, um, and 60% as hybrid, so your average you know, return, roughly, crudely speaking, is about 16.8 kilograms of grain per kilogram of nitrogen that we add to the soil. Right? And that's what yields our benefit cost ratio of 1.62. Now some of the, some of the evaluations that we've, that we've seen particularly one by, by um, Jacob Ricker Gilbert and, and Thomas Jane and others, um, their numbers suggest that the, that the marginal return to fertilizer use is actually closer to, to 12, which um, Andrew Dorwood questions, but if our return was that low, um, we'd no longer see these uh, positive economy-wide, um, uh, this positive uh, or, or a benefit cost ratio greater than one. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot more work needed in this area, and a lot of people are doing work in this area to really fully understand, you know, what are farmers doing with this fertilizer that they that they're getting? Are they using it appropriately? And you obviously have this trade-off issue as well. Um, if 70% of your budget is going into supplying fertilizer, there's not much left to actually pay for extension services. And maybe, you know, you know, the, the moment this return starts slipping, we start losing the gains from this program. Right, we also looked at fertilizer price risks. Um, nothing um, of the order of magnitude that we saw in 2008-09, but clearly a significant decline in these benefit cost ratios as the fertilizer price goes up. Um, and as the fertilizer price goes up, we have an exchange rate um, depreciation, right, which is expected again. And we kind of, you know, our, our, our economy is forced to, to generate more foreign exchange revenues um, in order to pay for this more expensive fertilizer. So what happens in our model endogenously is, is, is quite a significant reallocation of land into the tobacco sectors, tobacco being the, the major export sector in Malawi. Um, the, now, I, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to, to look into this carefully, but you know, thinking about the 2008-09 price shock, um, it wasn't long thereafter where Malawi suddenly oversupplied tobacco, and it's a, it's a major supply of Burley tobacco, the tobacco price collapsed, and that was the start of the financial crisis in Malawi. So maybe something to this effect did happen. It was you know, possibly um, you know, uh, you know, the start, the fertilizer price um, increase was possibly the start of, of, of the financial um, crisis eventually. Um, also much smaller uh, poverty implications as well when, uh, when the fertilizer price does go up. Now, the last thing we did was look at um, weather variability and how this program performs when we do have drought events. And here we draw on, on some earlier work that, that, that James and I had done um, on, on drought um, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, economic or production, um, maize production in Malawi. And we actually have some data uh, working with, with a group of meteorologists from, uh, from India showing the production losses associated with uh, droughts of different return periods, and these, these return periods tell us about the not only about the severity of the drought, but also about the probability of that event occurring. And we notice that local, the red line here is the local varieties, local maize varieties, much more um, vulnerable when it comes to droughts. Um, so much smaller losses for hybrids, and our composite varieties are actually supposedly um, the most resistant to droughts. So. What we thought about doing here was, well, actually, if we are shifting into subsidized maize production, which includes, an, you know, importantly includes a seed component and, and increases the, the, the amount of uh, improved seed varieties, then we're actually buying not only higher yields, but we're also buying greater drought tolerance um, when a drought does come along. And so the, the dashed lines down here show your benefit cost ratios for droughts of different um, severities. This vertical line is a, roughly a, a one in seven year drought, which um, I won't go into this, but that's kind of your average annual expected loss, um, which we talk about a lot more in the other paper. Um, but essentially what we have here is, you know, so for the actual program, which is the red line, um, we have a decline 
um, in the benefit cost ratio. And only when we reach a, a roughly a 1 in 13 year drought does it drop below 1. But then um, I'll just very briefly say what we really should be thinking about, well, what if we didn't have FISP? Right? We would have had much bigger drought losses. Right? Um, so this is an adjusted um, or a baseline adjusted um, so looking at the benefit relative to what we would have achieved if we didn't have FISP and, and still you know, had a lot of uh, local maize varieties in our, in, our, in our seed mix. Right, so conclusions. Um, FISP is reasonably pro-poor, has the potential to generate substantial indirect benefits, and we, we strongly believe that, um, you know, that this approach that, we, that we've developed here um, strongly complements uh, some of the uh, kind of partial equilibrium or, or micro-level survey-based methods. Benefit ratios depend very strongly on the marginal return to, to fertilizer use. So this is an important area um, of, you know, for intervention and, and, and to make sure that the program remains viable. Um, we need to um, make sure that these, that these marginal returns do not drop off. And, and, and really we need to get a better sense of what they actually are in the first place. Um, we did some work on uh, real fertilizer prices um, and... Um, saw that macroeconomic constraints in terms of paying for the fertilizer then really come into play. Um, the benefit cost ratios, as we said, they, they, they fall during a drought year, but the FISP does generate double dividends of higher and more drought-resilient yields. So there's a kind of a hidden benefit to this program as well.